Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. I am normally a very fast talker, so I'm going to try very hard to slow myself down a bit today, knowing <clears throat> that we do not have a native English-speaking audience, and hopefully the captions are coming out okay for everybody. Um, and, uh, and in some ways, I, I think it's important, um, just background on, on myself, um, I work a lot in cybersecurity, and as part of that, in what we would call the risk space, and I think there are risks to doing things and risks to not doing things. And I think AI is really an important field to think about the risks of using AI, but also the risks of, of not using AI. And, and we'll talk about that through. So quick introduction. My name is Joshua Peske. My title is very strange. It is 3CPO for any Star Wars fans. Uh, it's not uh, uh, C3PO, but uh, a sort of play on that, which has to do with uh, different um, kind of roles I play. Uh, and uh, Kim and I uh, have been working together for 30 years, believe it or not, in the nonprofit technology sector. Uh, like I was saying, I do a lot around cybersecurity, but also technology strategy, helping organizations migrate to cloud services, um, implement technology in ways that support their work. Uh, and be more secure, in particular working with uh, human rights activists, journalists, and, and folks like that. Over the last couple of years, Kim and I have been doing a lot around AI. And with that, I will hand it over to Kim. Hi, good morning, everyone. Wonderful to be here and or actually good afternoon. Um, and yes, I've been working with Joshua for 30 years. Um, and uh, I have been involved in, I'm the VP of Data Strategy, which is a little easier title to understand. And I have been helping nonprofits around issues related to data and understanding how to make data work for um, just overall improvement and understanding your business. Uh, that said, I also have done a lot of work in data privacy, and we will be touching upon that um, here. You are much more advanced than we are in the United States on that front. So anyway, I think we can, uh, wonderful to be Dive here. In. Yeah. Dive in. Um, so let's start with a poll real quick, which is we wanted to get a sense of, for the audience here, for the hundred or so of you that are, that are here today, what is your current relationship with artificial intelligence? And I think we have a poll, there we go. So are you clueless? You like have absolutely no idea about it. Um, you've heard of it, but kind of avoiding it, um, not wanting to try it for whatever reasons you may have. Curious, um, interested, but maybe haven't tried it yet. Are you engaged, actually using, or are you just all in, excitedly using these tools for work uh, in your daily life? And so uh, you can also let us know in the chat if you have another idea, although if you chat in Romanian, Kim and I will not be able to see it, but all of your colleagues certainly will be able to uh, to uh, do it. And um, yeah, I think I am uh, showing up as Kim as well. I think probably Kim, because the link you gave me was a personalized link oh, and thanks. I clicked it from that. I don't know, probably at this point it's late to change it, but hopefully they can visually tell that we are in fact different people. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, and I think if I hover over my name, I think Zoom tells me it's uh, it's me. It's just that label that's coming up that's uh, it's a little mislabeled anyway. Um, all right, so let's see what what the audience had to say. If uh, if Radu or Natalia, who's ever uh, handling the polls, I, I'm interested to see um, what everybody had to say here and where our audience is about. Wow, wow, this is really interesting because you are uh, significantly. So Kim and I do these presentations. This is probably the fiftieth version of some AI presentation we've done for different audiences over the last couple of years. I, Kim, is this the most engaged audience by a wide margin that we've seen? This is by far the most engaged audience by, you are, I'll say, leaps and bounds, and that will mean more in a moment, um, ahead of the United States. Just yeah, this graph is usually inverted. Um, <laughs> for what we see in the United States. It's about two thirds of the folks are are not using it, avoiding it, or just barely, you know, starting to use it, maybe a third engaged or all in. So, wow, great for Romania. Good, good for all of you. That's great. All right. So let's jump in. And you're wondering what's with all the frogs. Kim's got the frog behind her. I've got Clippy instead, but, uh, you know, 
<laughs> long story. <laughs> yeah, long story. Uh, uh, and why, what's with all the frogs? And it has to do with this lily pad analogy that we've been uh, using as a way to kind of explain um, why you're hearing and seeing so much about AI all of a sudden over the last couple of years. So let's think for a moment that we're all living around a lake and we're all in different little cabins um, around a beautiful lake and it's totally empty. The lake is pristine, clear, clean water, right? Not a weed or a lily pad on it, all right? And on June 1st, one lily pad is gonna appear and it's a funny little lily pad that's gonna double every day for the 30 days of June. So on day two, we'll have two lily pads. On day three, we'll have four lily pads. On day four, we'll have eight lily pads. Day five, 16, and so on. Until on day 30, the lake is exactly full. Every single inch, centimeter, sorry, we're in Romania. Every single centimeter of the lake is covered in lily pads, okay? Um, so, uh, for some of you, okay, there's a like old middle school math riddy, riddle, which is if the lily pads have been doubling every day, and on the 30th day, the lake is completely full, what day is the lake half full? And that is the 29th day, because of course, if they're doubling every day, the day before it's completely full, it must be exactly half full. Here is a trickier question to think about. What is the first day that the lake was more than 1% full of lily pads. And if you allow yourself just to kind of intuitively think of a number, most people will guess maybe the 10th day, the 15th day, but it's actually not until the 24th day that the lake is more than 1% full of lily pads, which means for all of us living around this lake, for 24 days, these lily pads have been doubling. There's now over 8 million of them on the lake. And yet most of us still haven't even seen a single lily pad, even though in just six days, the lake is going to be covered completely. Okay, so now we wanna ask you a question. Okay, if we think of AI development for humans, okay, the way of technology as a 30 day cycle, okay, where 30 days we have total artificial general intelligence, you know, the, the artificial intelligence is way beyond anything humans can do in every capacity. And day one is we're just starting. What day do you think we're at? This is just let us know in the chat. What day? Is it day five in your mind? Is it day 10, day 20, day 25? Do you think we're at? Well, where do you think we're at in terms of AI development? Let's see if anyone wants to tell us in the chat. I don't see any numbers yet. Is everybody there? Hello. <laughs> Do you have any guesses? Day five? Okay. Maybe people are trying to write it in English for us. I appreciate that. All right. 15, 3, 26, day 15. So there's quite a bit of range of where people think development is at. And, and there's not a right answer for this, by the way. This is an intuition. And so this is fascinating, right? We're seeing quite a wide spread among the audience. Kim, anything you want to say about that before we jump ahead? Oh, this is interesting. I, I wonder if there's differences in perspective, given, you know, how much more engaged in AI um, this yeah. audience in Romania is. So that's um, always learning. All right. So um, we, Kim and I will propose to you that whatever day we think it is, we think we're at this inflection point in, in exponential growth. And linear growth is this blue line here, which is how we experience the world. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, right? Exponential growth is this kind of strange thing. It's not intuitive to humans because it starts to do this very strange thing when the numbers get big, which it starts to go up very, very quickly. Okay, um, Radu, did you want to say something? I saw you just uh, came uh, on camera. No, no worries. <laughs> so, oh, okay, great. Go on. Okay. All right. So um, if we look at uh, AI over the just the last few years, okay, if we look at handwriting recognition, the red line, we look at speech recognition, the green, we look at image recognition, the purple, reading comprehension, language understanding, the human performance benchmark is here. And we see that just in the past few years, 
AI systems have exceeded human performance in all of these things. Okay. And, and by the way, it's not going to stop there. It's going to keep getting better. Okay. If we look at frogs, okay. Two years ago, that does not look like a frog. <laughs> okay. A year later, that's a pretty good frog. Okay. And by June of last year, I would defy any of you to guess better than chance at which is an AI frog and which is an actual frog. Okay. Um, they just keep getting better and that's image development. Our um, IQ, okay, um, I don't know if IQ tests are an international um, thing here in the US, um, certainly we have something called an IQ test, and the average human range tends to be between about 80 and 120 is sort of the average range of adult IQ. So just in the past month, Claude 3 um, reached completely average, maybe slightly above average human intelligence on an IQ test, and the chance that that was random guessing, right, is, is very, very, very small. Um, now, this can be very intimidating to folks that, that it's very good. So here's uh, one of the kinds of questions that these systems were asked to answer. Um, so we can give the audience a moment and see if this is uh, something that you can guess the answer to. We'll see. Kim, I don't know if you know what, what the correct answer is. <laughs> I have to think about it for a minute. Oh, I think I remember. I do but, have to, uh, yeah, I did have to think about it, but then it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. that one. E, very good. Eddie, whose name starts with an E, got E. Good job, <laughs> everybody. So so we're all pretty good. Um, so that's a, a, a sort of thing. Now, AI is not good at everything yet, okay? And so I think it's useful to show the kinds of things that it's really bad at. So one that I find very amusing, don't know if you have Where's Waldo out in Romania, but in the US, it's a very popular, uh, mostly children book, but adults find it where you try to find this character Waldo amidst a maze of people. Um, and if you ask uh, these AI systems to make you a Where's Waldo, they they do not understand very well what they're trying to do. <laughs> uh, so they guess, uh, yeah, here's try to find Waldo here in Bucharest, all right? Uh, fairly obvious where Waldo is there. Um, now, another thing that's kind of funny, if you're familiar with infographics, um, this is an organization I did a presentation for a couple of weeks ago here in the US. I asked uh, ChatGPT to make an infographic, um, and here's the infographic that it made. Uh, looks kind of good. Uh, I know many of you are not uh, native English readers. I assure you that uh, this makes no sense in English. I'm sure it doesn't make sense in Romanian. I'm sure it doesn't make sense in any language. It's absolute nonsense. Um, and you will very consistently get infographics that look like this if you try to use AI to make them. So um, people want them. People often will ask for infographics. So it's sometimes the nuance, nuance things, you know, it might do well on IQ, but on nuance, like where's Waldo or these infographics, you know, the, that's the human. <clears throat> human in the loop. Right. And the last thing I'll say before I hand over to Kim for a little bit is, um, for those of you who may not be familiar, Moore's Law, all right, a scientist, um, I forget his first name, Moore, um, about, I want to say, 25 years ago, was noticing that the speed of computer processing chips was doubling about every 18 months. And that seemed like it would continue. And then basically said that you could make some predictions about how fast technology would advance based on this doubling every 18 months of processing power. And that is actually held relatively true for the past 25 years. An interesting thing about AI development over the last five or six years is that it is doubling its performance about every six to eight months. It is exceeding Moore's law because even though the processing speed of chips is still doubling every 18 months, the algorithms and technology that power AI are also advancing. So it's advancing even faster. All right, Kim. All right. So let's just have a moment to think about what kind of AI means a lot of things. And, and some people will say it doesn't mean anything. There's no artificial intelligence. Anyway, so for the purpose of today, um, and, Kim, I just realized I forgot to share my sound, so I'm going to stop sharing very quickly okay. and then uh, and then reshare with my sound because I, uh, of course, I always forget to do that. Um, so back we go and continue. All right. <laughs> so I think this this will um, 
the slide will animate at the next click. So it, it, it will fill in. Okay, so artificial intelligence means many, many things, all right? And you've probably heard it, and the terms get thrown around quite loosely. And just, just to be clear, all right, you know, there's the vast landscape of artificial intelligence. There is machine learning, right? And that's that's basically the capability of computers to kind of program themselves. The next we have another kind of branch of artificial intelligence, natural language processing. And that's for, you know, the system to be able to process and understand languages. Deep learning, yet another branch of this big landscape of AI, is speaks more to the ability of AI systems to resemble Kind of to take on the the contours of the human brain to be that multi-layered um and all of these overlapping capabilities basically what josh showed earlier in that graph is what's going on and kind of the, the labels that we use for it large language models and that's what we're using and that's what we're going to be talking about for the most part today are these large language models that have really brought AI into the forefront and have kind of made it what people are talking about endlessly. And so going to the next slide, we we wanted we we had the um we were lucky enough right before doing a large class for TechSoup actually last year to attend this uh to attend a conference where we got to hear Tanme Bakshi, who's I think he was 19 years old um, and he's been like a genius of programming since, you know, he was five and he has, I, I felt one of the clearer explanations of what's the large language model doing under there. It seems like it's thinking, but is it? So Josh, I think if you play this. Say if uh, you ask ChatGPT, uh, what's AI going to do in the future, right? The way that ChatGPT generates a response for you is actually really interesting. It's effectively just entirely statistical language modeling. Given a sentence or given some sort of prefix, GPT's entire goal, its entire objective, is simply to take those words and predict of all the tokens in its known vocabulary, the probability of any one of those tokens being the actual genuine next token in the sequence. That's all that GPT is doing. What you're seeing right now is a genuine visualization of the way that GPT, specifically GPT-2, would generate a response. It is simply taking words and predicting the probabilities of which word will come next. So that's pretty mind-boggling. Say if... And, and Tan may... Actually, I want to add, just since this is a group of nonprofit NGO organizations, Tan may was thrilled to be giving, you know, that talk for a nonprofit audience because of a shared belief that, well, Joshua and I very much have, as well as Tan May Bakshi, that the more human-centered nonprofit people we have going to the learning and understanding and being able to talk about AI, the better it is for the world. But that said, is it AI? And Tan May was one of the people who would say, artificial intelligence, that's not really a term. It's probabilistic statistics, but tell me, would it make that many news headlines? Would you have come to this session on the opportunities and risks of harnessing the power of probabilistic statistical outputs? I would probably tell you that I can't even, I'm not qualified to give that talk. So there you have it. So what's ha another view of what's happening under the hood of AI, and I will need your annotation help here. One of the other reasons that AI has going so fast or going in such leaps is, is increasing data that's actually produced by us, by those of us using especially the free tools where what we put into a prompt is used for ongoing training of the AI. More speed, more data. Those are the things that make AI models get smarter. So on the one hand, we have the person inputting their prompt. Please help me do this task. Then it gets processed through the natural language processing, which then feeds off of the, both 
contributes to and feeds off of the data, right? So that prompt goes into the data. That natural language processing pulls from the probabilistic statistics from the data. It then outputs that into something that the human being can then say, okay, that's good or no, that's not bad. That's not what I was thinking. And that's what's known as reinforcement learning through human feedback, or RLHF um, is an acronym that you'll see. And the more humans are kind of also training the data, the smarter it gets. But that's basically the path of prompt goes in, the machine learning processes it, it draws upon its knowledge based on the data that it has consumed, and we give it feedback, yes or no, in the form of language often, not necessarily thumbs up, thumbs down. So of the tools, and since this is a pretty advanced audience and, and, and more engaged than those of us here on this side of the Atlantic, um, you're probably familiar with a lot of these tools. I just wanna differentiate four groups, the kind of range of free products, right? And I always say, <laughs> Um, we have a term, um, when it's free, it's not really free because kind of we're the currency, but that's a whole, that's another webinar for another day. But let's just say your data in the free systems is when it's going through that full cycle that I just showed you, where your data is also being used, what you put in the prompt is being used to train the overall system. Okay. so. Um, and it's interesting because a lot of people say, oh, is it learning about me? Well, these AI systems don't have a whole lot of memory for you in a session, but you are contributing to its knowledge. So we have the ChatGPT, Claude, which actually is not yet in Romania. It probably will be soon. And then um, Microsoft and Google um, have the Copilot and Gemini, which are both excellent products, free um, I will talk about enterprise products a little later, um, but those of you that have Microsoft Enterprise, you do have the option to actually use Copilot in your system, which is a little safer. Then on the other hand, we have paid AI, and that's ChatGPT4, GPT+, Plus. it's also known as. It has a pretty amazing capabilities, and we're going to be showing you some of those today. Also, Microsoft 365 Copilot and Google Gemini Advance are available like per user um, and no nonprofit discounts yet on those products, unfortunately. But that's the range of kind of text products. Joshua and I personally, full disclosure, use ChatGPT the most. Think of it as, yeah, no, you can go ahead to the next slide. Yeah, and you'll see why and soon probably. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get there soon. Um, so think of AI, we like to think of it as you're writing intern. Yes, it seems like it could pretty much just write the whole thing for you, but it's really an intern. So it depends what instructions you give it are really important to help it give you the answer that you're looking for, right? But it does pretty, you know, in terms of the natural language processing, great for first drafts. Um, it, yeah, okay, Josh raised the question, does the term intern make sense in Romania? So think of this as an, un, okay, unpaid person who, um, okay, uh, helps you get your work done, except the AI unpaid person never has to go to sleep and never says no. Um, so the so it helps with first drafts. If I, I know I have a really hard time with blank pages, it turns it out and then I can spend my time improving it or asking it another question. Summarizing, it's great for that. Um, editing, it's a good copy editor. It can correct grammar. Um, for marketing, it's it's consumed a lot of marketing copy. So it's pretty good with marketing and um, it's really great for coding and writing Excel formulas for those of you. And those are just the small examples, but these are the types of things you can ask it to do. Now, prompt engineering is a term that we've started hearing more and more of in the last couple of years, and that's learning how to re write prompts that um, give you the outputs you want. And, you know, there are debates around prompt engineering. Initially, it was this big skill that everyone had to learn. 
It's really about asking questions. And the a as the AI gets smarter, but you do want to tell it who it is, what part of its brain, which part of that vast source of knowledge do you want it to go and get information from? You want to be clear, just as you would with an intern, describing what it is you want that intern to do. If it's helpful, you can also provide some context. Um, you tell it how you want it to produce what you what you're giving it. And at times you can provide an example to the AI. This is an example of the type of uh, blog post I'm looking for, the type of list. And then you can also ask the AI questions. And for people who are just getting started, which um, probably are many of you have, have been doing this for a while, the base, best way to learn how to do really good prompt engineering it's experimenting. It's really asking questions. It's a largely non-technical task. It's more about thinking through the question that you want to ask. So, um, one, one quick point I, I just want to add, Kim, is that um, as strange as it sounds, um, a really effective way of getting better at prompting the the AI tools, the large language models, is asking them how to how to ask them questions. They're actually pretty good at giving advice on here's a good way to ask me the question to get the output you want, which seems weird, but it actually does work pretty well. Because it's natural language processing. That's when you start to think it's thinking though. But, <laughs> but it's probabilistic statistics. Um, and they're changing so all the time. So, so experiment with it, yeah. Yes. So on the image side, right, there's, Let's give this free. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. So free, there's free tools, Copilot and Gemini as well. Free-ish. The reason I say free-ish is they let you try experimenting, but yeah, you, you try without actually paying for it. Um, it. You end up paying for it, which is um, what I did with Midjourney, basically. Um, Dolly 3 is what comes with GPT+. Plus. It's also actually in the free version of Copilot. You just have more options in GPT+. And Midjourney, um, I, which I use less and less these days because Dolly um, 3 is so good. Um, so there, these can also be very, very helpful to nonprofit organizations um, around you know, creating images for blogs and things like that. Just wanna be careful about copyright and not trying to imitate someone's style. Like Waldo, <laughs> maybe that's the problem. Um, I hope I'm not falling too far behind. I'm gonna talk a little bit about kind of even more intelligence, putting the eye in artificial intelligence. I'm gonna show you in this next video, um, I got, I'm gonna explain it. It does it very fast and you will have these available to you. For any of you who have GPT plus, you have this ability to you to create what's called GPTs. And these are purpose driven bots. So it's like a, a, a full complete prompt wrapped up in a bot that you can then reuse and reuse and reuse. So Joshua and I use this all the time. Okay. Um, so I am just gonna, so we're gonna on the video. Um, which is going to take you through. So this is a bot that I found. So they have a whole bot store that you can look at. And, and you know, you, they do many things. I took a reporting, Extract Wisdom. It analyzes text. And um, we refer to the guy who actually created this, but it can read a text. Actually, his tagline for it is that, you know, give it a, a link or a document. And you can pause for a second now. Um, give it a link or a document and it will generate like notes like you've been reading it for hours so right it'll tell you what the ideas are with the, give you a summary of it it will pull out some resources named etc so that's an example of a gpt right um here i'm showing you data analysis so another one the gpts does data analysis i'm i'm pulled and important here and you can pause for a second josh um, just because this is a, an EU crowd. I pulled publicly available data for this, okay? And so remember the data that we put in is, um, you know, we need to think about what goes into these prompts and GDPR and things like that. So this is a fake data set 
using HR data, and I pulled public data intentionally. If, if I were to have used real data, I would have needed to anonymize it, and by GDPR standards, um, you would have to do the same. So basically, I fed it a big C CSV file, and it gave me a plan. It looked at the data, it gave me a plan, and asked me to confirm, and then I basically said, please proceed. So it showed different things that we can look at, employee retention, you know, uh, what trends are there in people staying at the organization. So uh, job satisfaction analysis, these were all things that it learned it could, you know, analyze from the data. So I asked it to please proceed with employee attrition analysis and then move on. So the initial high level analysis, it looked at data related to attrition or people staying on the job. And it gave me initially some percentages, looked at it by department, by education level, and it's generating these visualizations, right? I'm just basically said, please proceed. Now it's looking at it by job role. And um, see, so it gives us these bar charts. I can also say, give me these charts in different colors. Now it's looking at age groups. Um, and then here, if you pause for a second, here's one of the miracles of, of this kind of AI. It noticed that one of the columns, the data was not formatted correctly. So it um, went ahead and asked me if I wanted it to clean the data. Yes, please. Um, that's a wonderful thing. And so um, it went ahead and cleaned the data and then proceeded with its calculations. Here it's looking at a couple of factors, salary, hourly rate, right? And then... So as you'll see, it does that analysis. Then it goes on to do, I, I asked it to do some analysis looking at multiple variables at the same time, right? So it's looking at, uh, it's giving me one of these box and whisker charts, looking at a couple different attributes. Then I finally said, okay, I need to give this to my HR director in a, you know, an executive summary format, all of the findings that you've had. And it generated this. Now, while I'd be very tempted to just hand this off to the HR person because it looks so accurate, I would want to definitely review all of that first, but you'll hear more about that momentarily. Um, so those are just some of the kinds of things when I said GPT plus is very powerful. Um, so uh, yeah, so other, other things you can do, translation, I'm sure, I, I would imagine you probably are more familiar with this than we are even, but the multilingual meetings, as I think that feature is being taken advantage of in Zoom, things like that, it, it's come very far. And I think in the next slide, um, we show Tan May- Spuneți dacă întrebați chat GPT, ce va face AI în viitor, nu-i așa? Modul în care ChatGPT generează un răspuns pentru tine este de fapt foarte interesant. Este efectiv doar un model de limbaj statistic. Având o propoziție sau un fel de prefix, întregul obiectiv al GPT-ului, întreaga sa obiectivitate, este pur și simplu să ia aceste cuvinte și să prezică, din toate simbolurile din vocabularul său cunoscut, probabilitatea ca oricare dintre acele simboluri să fie următorul simbol real în secvență. Asta e tot ce face GPT. Ce vezi acum e o vizualizare autentică a modului în care GPT, în special GPT-2, ar genera un răspuns. E pur și simplu preluarea cuvintelor și prezicerea probabilităților cuvântului următor. Spuneți dacă... And uh, real quick, Kim, I'll just show, I'm just sharing this in the chat as well. România, numele meu este Joshua oh. Pesce cu Roundtable Technology. Acesta este AI, Lilypads și România. Acum s-ar putea întreba ce ne pot învăța Lilypads despre AI. Ne ajută să înțelegem exponențială. Să ne imaginăm. And so if any of you are wondering, well, gosh, if he speaks Romanian, why isn't he speaking it for the session? It's because I don't speak Romanian. Um, that was done oh. in advance. Yeah, can't do that in real time yet, but um, it's it's probably coming, I would guess, within a year or two, where you'd be able to actually not just see the transcription of this meeting, but actually have us translated into your language so it looks like we're talking in your language. My guess is that's probably a year or two out, if if even that long. Spuneți dacă întreba. All right, is this back to me, Kim? Yep. All right, so let's talk about AI readiness. 
Um, so now we have, a, I think, a scale question, right? Um, uh, no, this, is the, uh, this is a yes, no, not sure. Yes, no. Okay. Do you think that anyone at your organization is using AI for work-related tasks, like right now or has been for the last year? Um, yes, no, and not sure uh, are the options here. And uh, I will let uh, Radu and Natalia, um, as soon as we have like 60 or 70 percent responses, go ahead and share. Um, I will I will tell you that if you have uh, more than one person at your organization, <laughs> if you're the only person who works for your organization and you're not using AI, then you can confidently say no to this. But I will guess, especially, especially in based this on crowd. The yeah. Yeah, especially in this crowd. Yeah. So yeah. The, the very strong likelihood is that people at your organization are using AI. And those of you who said no, um, the five of you, um, unless you're the only person at your organization, it's quite likely that AI has been used to do work at your organization. So um, we feel very, very strongly that it makes sense to put an AI policy in place. So the, the title of the session has to do with opportunities and risks. And I think we've presented a lot of the opportunities here. What we haven't talked about are a lot of the risks. There are a lot of risks, okay? And we're gonna go into those. And the best way that you can ensure that your organization is getting the benefits from AI, but managing, right, uh, the risks of, of using those tools is by doing two things, okay? Step one is establishing what are the rules of the road for our organization as we use AI? What is it okay to do? What is it not okay to do? What data is okay to use with an AI system? What data is not? Which AI tools are okay to use? Which are not? How transparent are we when we use AI, right? So your policy is going to require you to make those decisions as an organization which will be helpful to you. Then you train your staff, right, on that policy and on the tools you want them to use so that they can begin using these things effectively and safely, okay? And we cannot emphasize enough how important that is. And again, the assumption is that they're already doing this. So if you think that by burying your head in the sand and not doing anything or, or by, you know, if you're worried that by, creating a policy and training staff, you're going to encourage AI use, right? That will bring risks. You're already experiencing those risks, okay? But you're not managing them at all. So wouldn't it be better to manage them, right? Kim, anything you wanna add on this or? Yeah, no, it's just, and people need guidelines for it. It's uh, optimize the opportunities, but minimize the risks. Um, oh, and we have this for you in Romanian that I think has, it's an okay translation. Again, ChatGPT did this. Not me. Yeah, and Kim and I made this like a year and a half ago, and we've been updating it, you know, to reflect sort of changes in AI. Uh, it's been used by dozens and dozens of nonprofits in the U.S., and we're very proud of that. Um, as people begin to adopt policies. I would even argue that within the US, most of the nonprofits that have an AI policy are probably using a version of this um, and the rest of them just don't have one yet. Um, and the vast majority of US nonprofits have no AI policy in place. And we know this for a fact because we're out doing these talks all the time and we ask and they uniformly say no. Um, they don't have this in place yet. We're trying to change that. All right. Um, so, oh, this is fantastic, Kim. All right. So let's look at, um, you know, the kind of, there are three broad areas of stuff you can do with AI. And it, while it, I, this is an oversimplification, okay, if we look on the, the left over here, as we go vertically higher, things get harder to do. They're more complex to get working, right, and to do. And as we go further to the right, they get more risky, right? Where it's it's more dangerous what could happen by using these things. So the three broad categories are generative, meaning making stuff, writing emails, creating images, making video translations actually falls into that, right? Um, translating our, our policy falls into this generative. Okay, these things are relatively low risk because they're fairly easy to validate. Okay, so even something that's a little hard, like translating our policy, as long as we have a Romanian speaker that can review it, 
right? We just say, can you please review this and let us know if there's anything here that's nonsense, right? Um, and you can review everything fairly easily, all right? And it's really easy to do. You just go talk to an LLM and you tell it to do it. As we get to analysis, that's what Kim was showing in her video, document summary, right? Analyzing data, doing predictive analytics on things, right? Now, this is incredibly powerful. It has tremendous use. It's a little bit harder to do, requires more sophistication, and there's more risk. You may expose data, the data may be incorrect, and you it's harder to validate whether the data is incorrect. Kim and I are working on a project internally at our organization doing some predictive analytics, and we asked for what's called an 80-20 analysis, which is basically how many of our customers do we have to get to before we get to 80% of our revenue? And we were trucking along, everything was great, and at one point, it spit out a list of the 50 highest revenue customers we have, and over 25 of them were made up. And what's even more fascinating is it made up revenue numbers for them, and that every single one of them was an actual nonprofit organization in the US, and all of them, weirdly, were from Connecticut, the state of Connecticut. Why it did this, I, I have some theories, but none of them are very good. That's an example of like, if we don't have the ability to validate that, that would be terrifying, right? And then at the very high end of complexity and risk, but also power is automation, all right? An example of an automation would be, let's give an AI access to our LinkedIn account for our organization. Let's give it access to an email account. And let's say, please go out on LinkedIn and look for people that match this type of profile. Donors, people who are interested in this particular cause, who live in Eastern Europe, who are interested in donating money, and then find their email address online, and then send them an email using my email account to see if they're interested in learning more about our organization. And then I'm just going to wait for replies to come in. This is an incredibly powerful idea. They're referred to as agents. So look for that word coming out, the idea of agents within AI. These are AI systems that you build that go out and perform actions in the world for you. This is very powerful, very scary, okay, and filled with risk and complexity. Kim, anything you want to add to all that? There's also on this more complex side, we, we've seen, and, and, and we've seen organizations do this successfully and not so successfully. Things like having an automated chatbot that can respond, um, you know, 24-7 to constituents, but sometimes if that hasn't been tested thoroughly tested on an ongoing basis you know so lots of organizations are using that kind of capability and it expands reach very much but you know using that especially with generative systems got one organization in a lot of trouble it was an eating disorders um nonprofit that you know was giving advice to, you know, to be and it actually, I think it had laid off some people who were, you know, phone operators and the help, you know, the crisis line, and it was giving bad advice around eating disorders. So it's, and that organization really suffered. It got in, it was in the news for this, and that's a reputational harm, you know. So that's, it was, you know, complex. It was both complex to build as well as complex to check, but it also ran on its own, right? So that added to its level of risk. All right. Um, so mitigating some of these risks, right? Um, there's a person we work with here in the U.S. His name is George Weiner. Um, so I give him credit for this. Um, I don't know if anyone could turn this into a, a nice Romanian phrase. If so, kudos to you. But here's the here it is in English, all right? It's called first, not final human in the loop six words okay first not final human in the loop and what that means okay is that the safest way to use ai in its current place is to make sure that the, the draft the output you get from an ai system is never the final version that goes out to the the, the end user right it's always reviewed by a human first Okay, so first, not final, human in the loop. All right, that is, um, actually, that's seven words. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, um, so anyway, uh, if anyone can make a nice, snappy uh, Romanian phrase for that. All right, and here's an example of, of this failing. That's what I was just talking about, yeah. Yeah, this. yeah, okay. 
Um, and so that's an example of where, because the human went out of the loop so that the end user, meaning a, a young person who's experiencing an eating disorder and goes to the chatbot, they're getting outputs from the system directly with no human in the loop. And, and that led to some bad things quite quickly. And that will continue to be true for some time. All right. Um, so here's a bunch of stuff in Romanian. Kim, I think you know what this is better yes. than I do. <laughs> you don't know that. Okay, so these are these slides, and there, there are three of them in here that have um, gray text like this or formatted like this. These are questions to ask, and they're just, um, this is more of a reference for you, but the types of questions to ask, this first one is around data bias, and you know that has a lot to do with the data that we use. What, does the data that we use um, contain any inherent bias? Do the algorithms that we've set up have bias? Um, this comes up a lot around decision-making AIs, right? Confirmation bias. Is the data in there to kind of tell us stuff that we know? Or has the system been designed in such a way to give a result we would be looking for? Um, interaction bias is another type of, and this speaks more to when you're developing tools, you need to think about these things, but interaction bias are the ways that we have people interacting with the AI systems that we provide also, are they biased in, a, in, in any way? And finally, latent bias, which is the last one, um, talks about um, basic, I guess, structural bias in data and in our systems that we just need to be aware of as we build these. And uh, so, yeah, no, uh, so this next one talks about, I will go through these quickly, but explainability and transparency. Can the system, like, do you know why it got to the answer that it got? And that's the question you'll hear, you hear people talking about that a lot, that explainability is a real problem. You hear that with social media, right? They, they use that a whole lot. We can't explain it. So when you are, especially when it's decision-making systems and especially given it's in the um, EU, you need to be able to explain or put a human in the loop. Um, so I think that's a high level summary of that. Back to you. And and one with a couple of the classes that we've done here in the US around ethics um, and safety and using these systems, I don't know um, if the trolley problem is something again that's common in Romania and US. It's it's a reference to a kind of classical ethical problem about you know um, pulling a lever to move a trolley from killing two people on one side of the track to one side on the other side of the track. Like, do you pull the lever? Like, is taking an action right? And so I we created a series of AI trolley problems as examples of you know there are risks to using systems. But then there are benefits to be gained by using the systems that you can't have if you don't use them. And, and so in that regard, it's very similar to a trolley problem, right? If I pull the lever, I'm, I'm saving two people, but I'm making a decision to kill another person. And what are the ethics of making that decision or not making that decision? These are hard problems. That's why they're, you know, you know, you know ethicists and philosophers have studied them for centuries. Um, but we've created a series of them and, and those will be provided to you as a resource as well. Okay. Um, and they walk through like, here are benefits that could be achieved by implementing AI, but then here's the risks of, of, of us doing that. All right, Kim, back to you. Um, and just quickly on the whole the bias, um, and I, this was put in the chat, you know, we think about bias, just going out for a second, in current LLM systems, we may not have much control over those, right? I can't kind of change chat GPT, open AI, in whatever inherent bias is in that system. So what I suggest is, or, or the kind of the, the, the practice is really to verify, know that these systems are capable of bias. When you're looking at them, certain kinds of art, I will not ask it to make because it's offensively biased. So I, I think be aware that there is bias built into these systems and be on the lookout for that. And when you put your human in the loop and review, um, that's when you can correct for bias and make sure nothing like that goes out the door. So let's talk about privacy for a moment here. Um, By the way, I'm trying the uh, the uh, hobbies for Andre and Maria right now, okay. just to, just because that, that's a fact. I've never heard that. That's fascinating. I'm seeing that. So. 
Um, so privacy and regulation, what happened? Uh, okay. Um, all right. So know that here's the short story answer to this. There's a lot of AI in the headlines and a lot lately because you just passed the AI Act. Again, you're ahead of us um, on this. Uh, yes, if you put data into ChatGPT and it you put personal data in there, you, you go in risk of, of GDPR. And that's so a data really needs to be anonymized, especially when you're using these public systems. Um, and by public systems, I mean free systems. Um, and so there's a lot, and we're going to be hearing a lot more about GDPR and AI. So my general tendency is to play it safe, anonymize, avoid using personal information. So, um, so Josh, if you go to the next slide. Right. So just know that your privacy ends at the prompt. Right. So it's private, whatever data you have. So it's not even gone into the system there using the, you know, the minute it gets sent in as a prompt, you have left the zone of privacy. And so beware of that with personal data or data that can be used to identify someone. Um, you know, I, I can't say it enough. You're much more in tune to AI, to, to privacy um, being in the EU than we are here in the US where it's, we don't protect our own privacy, but um, just beware of that and, and anonymize or use, um, and I'll, I think the next slide, so if you, Go on to the next one. This one does list some privacy questions, just, you know, that, that you want to make sure, like, if you're using data, even if it's anonymized, right, by GDPR, have, do, do people know that, do we, is that part of our consent model? Do we let people know, right? How do we store that data? How could we ever, you know, how could we honor a right to be forgotten? type of clause in um, and how we use uh, AI if we've input it into a system, right? So anonymizing data is, is the best way to do it, avoiding using any personal data, but ask yourself those data privacy questions. Someone asked a question about copyright and AI. Um, you know, if you put something, what you put in is no longer private if it's in a, like a public AI system. Um, if So if you put in, and companies have done this, people have put in like, uh, you know, I, I think Samsung, somebody submitted like some technical specifications that weren't supposed to go public and they put it into an AI system. That's it, it could be a copyright intellectual uh, property violation right there. Um, you know, usually we hear about copyright coming the other way from the, all the content that the AI systems themselves have absorbed. So going on to the next slide, um, the, oh, there's a third one. I know I, if you click, oh, that's weird. Okay. Um, so enterprise systems. So those are systems where you are safer. I would need to really check my GDPR though. And, and, and I'd want to talk with like a GDPR officer about like using personal information in an enterprise, but technically, so um, Microsoft enterprise, if you have, which licenses are they? E3, E5, are they the same license? E3, model? E5, business standard and business premium. Um, so if you have any of those, if you're using Microsoft, then you can access, it's called Copilot now, they interchange the name, something chat, Copilot, but you can access Copilot and use the generative, you know, tools within your own, it doesn't leave your system. So your, your chats are private. ChatGPT offers this, ChatGPT for Teams, that's what Joshua and I use. It is private. It's walled. So what what we put in there does not go out. Um, Gemini for Google Workspace is the latest offering. Um, we have not used that. We are we use Google at Roundtable, but we've not implemented that yet. So we have been using GPT for Teams and are 
you know, pretty happy with it. Again, it's a per user cost though. Bing Chat Enterprise comes with your Microsoft licenses. Um, and I'm not talking about the copilot that makes that's in Excel and, and in PowerPoint and Word. I'm talking more about a chat GPT like um, use of AI. So um, that you have more privacy safety there. And I think Josh, now we go back to the topic of cybersecurity. Yeah, so we're back in my field. And and to be honest, um, the cybersecurity world really hasn't figured out exactly like what AI is going to do good and what it's going to do bad. I will say that the, the thing that we are experiencing quite clearly is a significant uptick in the volume, the, the number, and the quality of phishing emails and to a lesser degree, um, phishing over social media. Um, the other thing that we have noticed, and um, for any of you with parents, grandparents, um, this is extremely prevalent in the US right now, um, is the use of voice cloning um, to extract money from people. And here's how it works in the US. Um, in the US, spoofing a phone number is very easy. So if I know Kim's phone number, I can call Natalia and it will look like it's coming from Kim's phone. Um, if I have about 10 seconds of Kim speaking, I can also quite effectively clone her voice so I can then make it sound like it's Kim talking on the phone. So the way this is being used in the US is that attackers are calling uh, like a 16 year old child, all right, getting 10 seconds of them talking, then calling their grandparent, all right, using their phone number, spoofing their phone, and then basically having the child's voice say, I've been kidnapped and I'm going to put you on with the kidnappers and they're going to tell you where to send the money so that, you know, I can be freed. Um, this is happening a lot in the U.S. and is incredibly effective. So that's just one example of, of how we're seeing it. So, um, but the biggest and most what you're most likely dealing with is a lot of phishing emails because what these AI tools have done is made it really easy for, let's say, I, you know, didn't speak Romanian and couldn't write in Romanian. Um, so it was harder for me to craft effective phishing emails to Romanian speakers. Now there's really no barrier there. I can do that incredibly effectively. So so that's um, what we're seeing a lot of. Um, uh, one of the smartest people in the space is a fellow named Daniel Meisler here in the U.S. And so blue team is what I'm technically on, um, which is the defense side. Red team are attackers. Um, you can have good folks on the red team, too, that kind of operate as attackers or adversary emulation, as it's called. Um, but uh, in the short term, we expect things to get worse. In the longer term, Daniel thinks that these tools will help the, the defense more. But that may be a couple of years before we get there. And these kinds of predictions are very, very hard. Um, so, yeah, lots of deep fakes, uh, lots of voice cloning, lots of fraud around this. And um, the, the primary defensive tool that you have around this is training. What I just explained about voice cloning and everything, you know, audience of seniors, I've done that for in the U.S., um, you know, are, are significantly more resilient to these attacks. You can think of training done well as effectively like a software update for humans. And the way that we defend ourselves better is by upgrading our software, which means learning, which is unfortunately hard um, and requires time and effort, but it's, it's the best defense. Go ahead, Kim. I just found it notable that on this map by Statistica, Romania was one of the listed examples. Yeah. Not every country is on there. So so it, it is exploding there. And someone remarked on it, especially in, in, in Facebook and things like that. Yeah. All right. Um, so <laughs> one word security training, verify. 
before you take any action, especially if it involves money, um, take a moment to verify that it is actually a legitimate request, a legitimate uh, alarm, a legitimate um, you know thing. And we have a whole training on this that we do around cybersecurity awareness. Uh, happy to tell folks more about that if you're interested in getting that in English. Um, we do something here in the US. Uh, uh, Roundtable does our Kim and I's company that we've been doing for 10 years now, which is called the best free one hour of cybersecurity awareness training ever. We do it every year. Every year it's better than the previous year. So it's, um, and, and it's free. All right. Uh, so now we have, uh, I think a sliding scale. We'll see if, uh, if this is set up and, uh, and we're interested in how you think AI will impact jobs in nonprofits. Um, so you can say it will replace people's job. You can disagree with that by doing zero, or you can say, yes, it will definitely replace people's jobs uh, by putting in a five. You can say whether it will create new jobs. If you don't think it will create any new jobs, you put zero. If you think it will create lots and lots of new jobs, you put a five. If you think it will make people better at their jobs, uh, if you don't agree with that, you know, if you think it won't make people any better, make put a zero. If you think it will make people a lot better at their jobs, put a five. And um, Kim and I certainly know what our answers to these questions are. Not, I, I will save them. I, I mean, at least I think I, I think I know what Kim's are. I know what mine are. Um, and let's see what uh, what the audience thinks. Um, so I, my answer, Kim. Well, why don't you give your answer first, Kim? Are we are we um, biasing the jury? Um, well, now they, they've they've given their answer, so oh, okay. I do think it is going to replace a few jobs. It's not going to be a massive layoffs. So yeah, that I would give like a three, right, or 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 two even, right? It it, it is going to happen, but it's not going to be on a grand scale. It is going to create some new jobs and some new talents. Um, for sure. And especially when you get that more complex side of the range, there's going to be new skills. Um, there are probably going to be less people like coding, though, and more people asking questions. And then uh, it is for sure disrupting jobs. Um, and yes, we're okay to stay seven. Yeah, we're, we're okay if everyone else is okay. Yeah. We tried to so hard not to go even over. started yet here in the U.S. You know? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> no one started working yet. Yeah. Um, but it's about yes, to start getting coffee here. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny. I I was uh, looking at. I do a lot of project management type of uh, work, and you know, people project managers were freaking out at first. Oh, is AI going to replace my job? And and the thing was, well, no, AI is not going to replace your job, but the project manager who knows AI might so that's where we think there's a risk in not learning but that, that's my long-winded short answers and I, i'm inclined to i don't know about replace replace is a strong job i think change if that was change or replace people's jobs or displace jobs i probably would give it a five replace i'd probably more at like a four or a three but definitely i'm a five on the other two um, but the spread of the audience is really interesting. This is really interesting. Um, by the way, Kim, we're, we we have to adopt Elena's um, Andre and Maria thing. Okay. So I just want to thank uh, Elena for this and just say that. So for Andre, Gemini suggested as hobbies, coding, photography, board games, learning an instrument and sports. Okay, that's Andre. For Maria, also a 13 year old, creative writing, Poetry, short stories, journaling, dance, hip hop, jazz, painting or drawing, uh, sketching, uh, learning a musical instrument. There's the one, and photography. <laughs> wow! They, they, you know, just it's, by it's, changing it's the name, all the only aspect of the prompt that changed was the name. Please suggest hobbies for a 13-year-old named. Andre or named Maria, and that's how different the output got. That is probabilistic statistical outputs for you. So thank you, Elena. We are absolutely incorporating that into our training going forward. All right. Yes. Um, so uh, real quick, uh, the elephant in the room, the the job changes and displacements. The the only thing we can say about this, okay, right now, um, and Kim has a great expression about that, which is you think of jobs as fundamentally existing to to solve problems for humans. 
then the question to ask yourself is, do you think we're going to run out of problems? And I think if you ask it that way, it's fairly obvious, you know, we'll all have jobs of some kind for quite some time to come. And if we don't have jobs, then it isn't a problem by the very nature of the question. <laughs> it, um, so if, if not having jobs is a problem, then there will be jobs to deal with that problem because that is what the human endeavor kind of is. Um, what I will say is that historically technical, technical innovation, all right, does displace jobs, but does not cause a net loss of jobs. And this has been true time and time again, going back to the steam engine, going to the creation of the telephone in the United States, up through computers and robotics and automation and all these things, okay? Yes, there is displacement, right? Some jobs go away, but an equal or greater number of jobs is created through these technical innovations. Many of us work in jobs that didn't exist 20 years ago. Kim and I certainly do. Um, whether this will be true of AI, I have no idea. I, I, I couldn't begin to predict that. I will say, I don't see how using these tools, all right, to get yourself better at your own job could hurt you. Um, it, it seems to me that it could only help you to understand the capabilities of these tools and learn how to use them effectively. And, and that's why Kim and I do this training. Um, quick piece of data of the limited data that's coming out so far. Um, this is from uh, Boston Consulting Group here in the US uh, in a partnership with, and they had a bunch of knowledge workers use AI over a three month period. And what they found is if you think of the distribution, like if I'm a D performer and Kim's an A performer, okay, and we both start using AI, what happens is Kim gets a little bit better, but I get a lot better, all right? And everybody kind of levels up to this higher level. This is what the early data is showing for AI adoption among you know people who are knowledge workers primarily, meaning they're working with data, working with text, working on computers for much of their day, things like that. Um, whether this will play out or not, we'll see. But if it does, that's a tremendous um, advance for society. Um, moving everybody's performance up that level is would be an incredible outcome. Um, another thing, Kim, I'll let you talk to this one really quickly. Yeah, so this was, um, you know, there, I'm sure there's some bias here. So this was a report that Microsoft did on the use of Microsoft tools. So take they take it with that understanding. But this is so they they had a group of users. Um, you know, they looked at group of users who used uh, Copilot, groups of users who did not, and kind of so generally. And you can I'm not going to read all of these different things, but the the one I am going to focus on, the one Josh just marked, Copilot users found tasks to be 58 percent less draining than non-users. I will completely agree with that myself. It has allowed me to take on tasks, and again, that first not final draft, having something to com compose that for me. Um, and also sometimes when I just need to ask it ideas and um, you know get some ideas going back and forth, the amount, the lesser brain drain is significant. And when we think about, you know, at nonprofits is similar to the, are we gonna run out of work problem? At nonprofit organizations and NGOs, do you ever have too much time in a day? No, we always trying to trying to finish, you know, we never get everything finished. So, and to the and less it, draining is a quality of life thing. And it looks like we got some questions, and we'll we'll wrap up here, and then we can stay Radu and Natalia as much Q and A as people want to do, just very quickly. So this is sort of Kim and I's last couple of years here, so um, or last year and a half. So October of, of 2022, we taught a six week course here in the U.S called Too Soon, which is kind of funny. Right after we finished that course, ChatGPT came out and you know the AI kind of exploded. So that was kind of funny. Um, TechSoup hired us to do a course in April, May. We threw this course entirely out. That's a mere like six months later. Okay, <laughs> made an entirely new course. They asked us to do another one in October, November of last year. Threw, threw this one out, sorry, made an entirely new course. And while this was going on, these are just the major AI innovations that happened. Um, and since this, Claude has come out and is now, you know, that 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 model that's 101 IQ, right? And and that's since, you know, the last time we did this training. So um, it's, it's really rapidly changing. 
And there's good news and bad news about that. The bad news is that it changes really fast. The good news is that any of you that start really using this stuff and following it for a month, you're just as caught up as Kim and I. And if we stop trying to stay caught up in reading and using these tools, we'll be behind you in a month. Like, so it, you can catch up quite easily. Um, and uh, that's it. And we thank you so much, Tech Super Albania, for oh, having us. You.